coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. We, we never really got serious about war, the war on terror. And so we're, we're stuck still today. One of Angelo's great lines was the whole point of war is to change the way of life of your enemies, not to change your way of life. So, you know, we still have the Department of Homeland Security, the largest bureaucracy ever created. We still have to suffer the indignities of the TSA with the farce that somehow they're keeping us safe in the sky when, whenever they audit the TSA, you know, something like, uh, you know, one in five weapons that is like pistols will get through TSA security. So uh, Angelo had proper contempt for, for all of this. Welcome, everyone, once again to The Roundtable, the publishers and editors podcast at the American Mind at the Claremont Institute. I'm your host, Ryan Williams, president of the Claremont Institute, publisher of the American Mind and the Claremont Review of Books, joined by Spencer Clavin, features editor at the American Mind, associate editor of the Claremont Review of Books, Seth Barron, managing editor of the American Mind, James Bullis, executive editor of the American Mind, and the one and only Matthew Peterson. Vice President of Education, founding editor of The American Mind. Many of you have probably seen notice of this, but we all at Claremont got some sad news Monday of uh, Angelo Cotavilla's untimely death. He um, was involved in a car accident uh, on his way from Stanford Medical Center back to his uh, beloved vineyard in um, Plymouth, California. Uh, these are always hard when they're unexpected. Uh, Angelo, you know, he was <laughs> pretty hale and hearty, still had a few health issues but uh, was otherwise doing fine. So it's, uh, it was pretty sad, sad news to hear of. He's one of these types uh, I mentioned in the short eulogy I wrote for the American Mind. Uh, Angela is one of these types like Mike Yeoman, our other senior fellow who's left us a little too early. Uh, you, you kind of know ahead of time that they're irreplaceable, but then you're, you're kind of struck by it repeatedly uh, in the months and years after they're, they're gone as you want to ask them this or that or seek their counsel on this or that. So I thought we would just do a bit of a remembrance uh, show for Angelo. I will start with me. I've known Angelo for, I knew Angelo for the better part of 16, 17 years. Uh, We'd grown a lot closer over the last five years. My wife and I went up to his vineyard on a few occasions, and I've been up since as Angelo needed help with this or that. And it was, uh, it's not too tough to get up there for us. Quick flight to Sacramento or just a six hour drive up the Central Valley. Readers and listeners know Angelo, of course, for his polemics and his sharp pen and sharp mind on everything from the war on terror to the current regime pathologies in America to this rolling cold civil war that we're experiencing a term he popularized and and wrote quite a bit about. But he, you know, he had a wide, wide ranging repertoire. I just wanted to read one thing uh, that's pretty brand new. It's really the last thing he wrote. Uh, He sent it to Michael Walsh, our our friend over at the Pipeline, among other things, uh, Michael's online publication. Michael's commission is putting together a a book on the Great Reset, and he's going to do some conferences and stuff. And Angelo was asked to contribute something about education, and Angelo wrote that up. And uh, I just think his concluding paragraphs of this piece which you can find at the-pipeline.org. I think we republished it at the American Mind too. Shows his breadth, um, you know, after a sort of tour of the corruption of American intellectual life, you know, starting with Descartes and running through Kant and Hegel and Marx and Feuerbach and all the the others. uh, He concludes this way with some sound political advice for our, our current Republicans or right wingers or really anyone who is in policy who cares about American, the American regime and American education. If all they did all day was just take Cotevilla's advice on various topics, the country would be in a lot better place. So this is how he concludes. Cutting the life support of higher ed institutions requires exposing how little, if any, good they do by comparison with the price and opportunity costs of attending them. A little political action can go a long way in this regard by imposing on them the same requirements for transparency about the effects they have on those they serve as apply to other providers of goods and services. Reputation, prestige, 
is literally the main product that they dispense. What do you get for four years at Old State U? What about at Old Ivy? These questions deserve empirical answers. Institutions advertise the percentage of students they admit and sometimes the entrance test scores, implying that they select the best and make them better. But the edu class rejects categorically comparing students' test scores, absolute and or relative, before and after they attend. The rejection's vehemence is increased as the amount of study required for graduation has fallen. Legislating transparency and educational outcomes is the most potent weapon against scam. Fact-based challenges to establish colleges' hazy claims to beneficence can also help those who start up replacement institutions. What if, as is entirely possible, test figures bear out that the average student is not better able to think after four years at Old State or Old Ivy than before? Could it be that they did not demand more of the student? There's plenty of evidence that they demanded less than in previous decades. The new colleges can credibly pledge to improve students, at the very least, by requiring more work of them. More important, but beyond empirical demonstration, is that the substance of what is being taught, the manner and ethos of education, especially as it flows down from the peaks of ac academe, have corrupted, are corrupting America. All manner of corruption is so imminent from America's commanding heights on down as to make superfluous the presentation of facts and arguments about it. Whoever would reset education in America from its current path must begin by noting and denouncing its corruption of our civilization. Each new generation internalizes civilization as it does its maternal language. Restoring the integrity of the civilization into which we educate succeeding generations requires educators to pay attention to its languages, every word. So that's Angelo, just a taste of his, uh, he had a pretty consistent style and I'm sure uh, veteran readers of him. I uh, can hear the old man there, and uh, we're, uh, we're all impoverished by his passing. Uh, we can get into various aspects of his legacy. And uh, I'll add just on a personal side, Angelo is always very gracious in person. He's sort of a hard man, uh, would let you know, let you damn well know he disagreed with you, uh, and even in, in harsh terms, uh, if he was so moved. But as a friend, uh, he was very generous. Uh, I mentioned in my eulogy that, you know, we, my wife, Amelia, and I went up to uh, help Angelo and Anne seven or so years ago bottle a whole barrel of Zinfandel, which, you know, takes a couple hours. It was with a, a hand corker, too. So that was a good old fashioned hard work. And I forget how many cases are in a barrel. It's probably like 30 ish, maybe even 40 ish. We, we helped them do that for a couple hours, stayed overnight. They fed us great food. And, uh, and uh, sent us on our way with six cases of wine for free, which we served at our wedding. You know, a lot of family wines you want to reject out of hand or politely find a way not to take too much of, but that certainly wasn't the case with Angelo's uh, Zinfandel, which he picked early old world style. So it's it a pretty light, uh, delicious, delicious wine. Anyway, it's just one small example of his um, generosity, which he extended to friends. And he's a very loyal friend as well. Uh, lifelong friends with, with Mike Ullman, as I mentioned uh, another loss we've had in recent years. And he's got five kids and a bunch of grandkids scattered throughout the country. So uh, his legacy includes all of them and all the good things that they're up to, too. So with that, I will, uh, I'll see the floor for now and just see if anyone has anything else to add. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll never forget driving up for the first time uh, with you, Ryan, <laughs> to, uh, to the vineyard, making the pilgrimage. Um, yeah. <laughs> to uh to see to see angelo uh in his element and you know going up there and driving around uh with him in in uh driving around the vineyard and you know just kind of looking uh fixing some things <laughs> i think i was in dress shoes at the time <laughs> uh but it was great uh but he just um he was just the, the, the you can tell by where he lived i mean he he was also in Wyoming and generously offered his place up to my wife and kids and I when we were driving across the country looking for a place to move in the time of COVID uh, and madness. And I mean, he lived in beautiful places that he had, you know, sought out that were, um, you know, just, I mean, iconic, I think, to me, American kind of country. And in both of those, uh, locations. He he was very involved with the outside and with nature, right, in a visceral kind of way, uh, where he was willing to do manual work uh, as well as uh, intellectual work, and knew a lot about 
his surroundings. And there's kind of this Renaissance man quality to someone like him who'd worked in government and been a professor and written books and had all these all these qualities working together in a way that's just rare in any time and place and is is certainly rare now. And um, to give a sense of of this, um, what I'm saying about uh, his life and, and kind of where he chose to reside as he got older, when we were on our way to his place in Wyoming, um, you know, with four kids in the car, he was on speakerphone and I asked, uh, hey, um, we're going we're gonna to go there. I, I assume you have, uh, you know, weapons in the place because it is in bear country in Wyoming and it's Angelo and probably a lot of hunting that goes on and there were five, five boys, right, that were raised there. And the got, car got quiet for a second, and I could tell my kids were listening eagerly, you know, are there weapons at the house? And Angela just said, oh, yes, there are <laughs> guns and knives strewn about the place. <laughs> 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 Which was absolutely true, as it turned out, um, not in a crazy way, but, you know, there were guns and knives. And, of course, uh, the entire car was filled with delight, lots of, lots of glee uh, on the way there. And, I mean, I, I, I just echo what Ryan said. I mean, there's so many examples of this. I mean, this is a man who gave a, what, a research assistant job to someone named Peter Thiel when he was in teaching at Stanford. This is a man who, before anyone on the right would talk bad about the intelligence community, was going after the CIA. And I, I believe if you put in Angelo, Angelo, Angelo Cotavilla and CIA, uh, used to come up before the American Mind article, a, a, a FOIA document from the CIA, where internally they're saying, who the hell is this Angelo Cotavilla guy who works <laughs> as a staffer and is asking uncomfortable questions that we're not used to asking, and apparently wrote this, uh, wrote this, as, this article against us um, at ghostwriting for his, his, um, his senator that he worked for at the time. And you know, he was he was early to that. Um, obviously, as everyone's been pointing out, he was he reintroduced the phrase, as far as I can tell, pretty much single handedly, uh, the ruling class, which is a, an old book, I think, from the 50s, um, as he would point out, but um, a title of a book. But he reintroduced that phrase well before anyone else sort of saw in conservative commentary land what was going on. And. And then when it comes to foreign policy, he was just ahead of the game and saying what's, you know, what's going on in the early Bush years is going all wrong and, and writing for the Claremont Review books about that. And then when it came to education, you know, he strong views, as, as Ryan just read, about what real education is, um, how it's tied to great texts and, and kind of liberal arts uh, education for real, uh, the skills, the arts of, of the mind and soul. And on top of all that, I, I guess I would say what really marks men like him out to me is the fact that, uh, you know, we knew them when they were older, so you don't know quite what they were right, like when they were middle-aged and younger, but they, they didn't suffer fools gladly, but they also helped anyone uh, and everyone and were very kind to people, even if they were, you know, tough when they disagreed or saw something wrong, spoke forthrightly without any, without any qualms about any topic, they thought they knew something about and 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 just recognized were willing to recognize talent and virtue outside of credentials right there was no i mean it didn't matter to him where the truth came from or who said what um that those games were were silly and were beneath him and and that, that that's that's inspiring especially in a, in a day and age like this and i, I just regret that i hadn't I leaned on him more. I spent more time asking him questions in, in the last few years, of course, um, along with everyone else. And finally, uh, in this uh, long discourse, um, finally, I should say there were some uh, some hilarious times behind the scenes uh, at American <laughs> Mind where uh, we we made the mistake of trying to edu edit the great Angela Cotavilla, and <laughs> and he corrected us. Um, <laughs> Uh, about what his desires were in terms of his own writing, and of course, we were uh, more than happy to uh, to uh, to accede to his demands. Um, and and those are the kinds of um, the kinds of interactions where you know let let his will be known, and 
Uh, you could argue about uh, that kind of thing, but also intellectual things with him uh, and, um, and, and remain lifelong friends. In fact, because you could argue about those things, you were, you were friends. So um, I, just, I just regard him as someone who I, I wish I'd, I'd uh, sought out even more um, than I did in the last few years. And also a model that is passing away of the model of someone who is both uh, a doer and a thinker and had a breadth of, of knowledge and soul that is exceedingly rare. Just a note on those interactions around edits, Matt, which, you know, we would be, I think, remiss not to mention them because despite the, you know, fact that they could get tense, it was also, as you say, clearly part and parcel of what made the man great and noble and lovable. It came along with the forthrightness that enabled him to speak just completely you know, irreverent truth to power. That's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, but he he did that and he had none of the pieties that stifle so many conservatives now and choke our discourse. He was always, every interaction with him, whether over email or, you know, in the spectator or the American mind or wherever, every encounter that you had with his mind was like this breath of candor and, and fresh air. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why he was so transformative. And it also meant that when he spoke to you with praise, when he reached out and said that he liked something you had written or which he did frequently, he was generous in that way, too. And it meant so much in, in, because of that, of course, you know, and that's something that is another ancient truth. He would have been the first to tell you that like flatterers, the, the words of flatterers mean nothing. And People who tell you the good and the bad carry more weight, and he was an embodiment of that. I, I don't have too much authority to memorialize him, and I'm not really worthy of it because I only met the guy in person one time. But I will, I will note that when we talk on this podcast about boomers and you know younger conservatives and this kind of boomer mindset that locks people into old pieties and old ways of thinking and stops the conservative movement from moving forward out of fear or whatever. Um, we do our, our best to remind people that Boomer is a state of mind and not an age. And the person I think that we every time when we wanted a counterexample for that, we would cite Angelo. Angelo was the most read person on our site for long stretches of time, many times. Um, he galvanized people my age and younger. Uh, those of us who never met him or only met him briefly felt as if we knew him because he radicalized us in so many ways from the war in Afghanistan to the ruling class. I mean, paragraphs that just stick in my mind like etchings and have completely not just transformed the way I think about things, but the phrases that I use to identify again, in those plain terms, what's going on. I mean, he set so many young people free of the pieties that were sickening them and, and, and gave people permission to say what was true without fear. And that was very beautiful. I have even less room or authority to speak about the man having never met him. However, I did exchange emails with him and regarding his last piece for us, on the uh, graveyard of narratives and the uh, disaster in Afghanistan, I, I was so impressed by it and just I, I, I was telling all these people I know, like, you've got to read this. This, this guy's amazing. There's this one line. He said, um, what did the U.S. government actually do in Afghanistan and Iraq? Only the things it really cares to or knows how to do, namely richly to hire its favorite people to try reshaping mankind in their own image, which I just loved. You know, I'm so beautifully phrased and just so true. And I, when, I, when I wrote to him and I was like, oh, you know, the piece is great, uh, said rather blistering. And he just responded, not blistering enough, <laughs> which, which just seemed great. Uh, look, I have, very, I have nothing else to say about the guy except, you know, everything I've read of his is terrific. Yeah, I've got, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard faced with a loss like this not to feel a bit melancholy. And in this case, you know, not just as, as a fellow human being, uh, but as a, a writer of a certain age, uh, you know, you, you come to realize over time that the, uh, in spite of appearances, the number of words that you will spill out 
is in fact finite. Uh, it will, you know, the, the river will come to an end, um, not necessarily when you expect it to. And one of the, you know, small tragedies of, of being a writer of a certain age is, you know, it, it is only in hindsight that you say, you know, I wish that I spent more time with those who came before me while they were still alive. But instead, um, as was my case recently, you, you must spend more time hunched over your laptop, um, driving yourself relentlessly inward in order to write your own books. And uh, Angelo was someone who managed uh, a tremendous level of output uh, that was very intelligent and very wise, but also very accessible. He said not only what, uh, what must be said, but what he wanted to say. Um, and, you know, doing one of those two things is difficult all on its own. He managed to do both. And it is sad that he is not around to do that more because God knows that's what we need most of all right now. Um, I just want to pull out one, one quote from the, uh, the now somewhat famous uh, article um, on America's ruling class. And uh, that was 2010, I believe, summer of, of 2010. Um, the mark of, uh, of a really thoughtful writer um, and a theorist who can write well um, is that their remarks grow more true as things change. Um, that's a feat that, that few can lay claim to. Angela did it. Um, and this is one example of why. Uh, this is from about, I don't know, toward the end of the first third of the, uh, of the essay. Um, and he, he wrote The Progressives. This is after World War I uh, and after the collapse of the, uh, the League of Nations. Um, at least the, the dream of the League of Nations as it was originally conceived. The progressives, for their part, found it fulfilling to attribute the failure of their schemes to the American people's backwardness, to something deeply wrong with America. The American people had failed them because democracy in its American form perpetuated the worst in humanity. Thus, progressives began to look down on the masses, to look on themselves as the vanguard, and to look abroad for examples to emulate. The cultural divide between the educated class, quote unquote, and the rest of the country opened in the inner war years. Some progressives joined the, quote, vanguard of the proletariat to the Communist Party. Many more were deeply sympathetic to Soviet Russia as they were to fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Not just the nation, but also the New York Times and National Geographic found much to be imitated in these regimes because they promised energetically to transcend their people's ways and to build uh, another quote unquote here, the new man. Uh, now, there are a couple different meanings for the new man there, but the one that sprung to mind for me is, uh, is the, uh, the Novi Sovietsky Chilevek, the new Soviet man or new Soviet person. You can look this up on Wikipedia. They have a nice quote from Leon Trotsky about the communist man as the man of the future in his 1924 book, Literature and Revolution. Trotsky said, man will his purpose to master his own feelings, to raise his instincts to the heights of consciousness, to make them transparent, to extend the wires of his will into hidden recesses, and thereby to raise himself to a new plane, to create a higher social biologic type, or if you please, a superman. So, you know, if you cast your eye across America today, uh, trying to uh, assess our regime's attitude toward technology uh, and toward uh, those of us who it views as uh, the subject of its technological schemes, uh, you will see these exact patterns being replicated uh, despite the, the manifest failure of the Soviet Union, despite the, uh, the ignominious end of uh, at least the, the uh, the progressive movement of 100 years ago. Um, once again, uh, we have a regime that is attempting to, uh, to create a, a new person, um, almost a new species of person, uh, one that I would describe as a cyborg person um, and one that, uh, that Americans from the very beginning have instinctively uh, rejected and rebelled against because of the way in which it, it, you know, it, it ends up creating subhuman people, not superhuman people. The, uh, the utopians and the dystopians uh, of the old world, um, America has proven wrong in various ways. Uh, and that stubbornness, that intransigence um, has been a source of outrage and disgust uh, to far too many of our rulers um, who shouldn't be rulers, but that's what they are uh, over the past 100 years. Um, and this appetite to, uh, to terraform the populace, to create, to create new, new man, new woman, uh, ultimately to destroy the uh, natural distinctions between men and women 
um, this is very much at the forefront of uh, the forces that we are contending against. Um, the forces that, uh, you know, in, in today's uh, vernacular, um, Angela first sketched out uh, now just over a decade ago. Uh, the, the, the unfolding of this phase has, has taken at least a decade, no end in sight. Um, and it's going to require the same degree of, uh, of intransigence and opposition um, that, uh, that was called upon in the past. Um, you know, the, I'm quote unquote optimistic insofar as, you know, Soviet Union has had about as good a chance as any regime to build the new man. Um, and ultimately they failed. Um, the bad news is, uh, they took a good 50 years to, uh, to impose the cost of that failure on their people and on others. Um, and uh, this regime seems uh, to be even more ambitious and uh, even more misguided um, and in control of even more dangerous technology. So uh, it seems like a tall order to face these things. Uh, then again, you know, Angelo was of the generation that saw uh, real, um, you know, annihilation <laughs> rise as a possibility and perhaps even a probability uh, in the form of uh, a nuclear exchange with the, the new men of the Soviet Union. And that didn't happen. Um, so, uh, uh, even, even when it is quite dark indeed, um, there are still reasons to, uh, not just greet the day with gratitude, but to go out there and, and do the work, um, and to, uh, trust that your work is not in vain. And so that's, uh, that's what lingers with me this week. And, uh, and I hope, uh, that, uh, in the, in the minds and hearts of, of others, when they think of Angela, that's the sort of thing they keep in mind. Yeah, I wanted to share one thing I, I'd mentioned it on the live stream we did uh, yesterday, sort of impromptu at Dave Raboy's urging. So if, if some folks have heard that already, forgive me for repeating myself, but it's a wonderful anecdote. I want to make sure everyone hears it. But Matt mentioned that Angelo, you know, uh, knew how to strike real fear into the hearts of fear and loathing into the hearts of bureaucrats, especially intelligence community bureaucrats back when back when the Senate and Senate staff and Congress knew how to do real oversight, which they haven't done really in decades now. So in the seventies, Angelo was on the uh, select committee on intelligence. Uh, he worked for Malcolm Wallop, Senator from Wyoming and uh, was instrumental in, in um, sort of laying the congressional predicates for the strategic D defense initiative and uh, brilliant pebbles was one of the uh, working code names for it. You know, it's space-based missile defense, which, uh, we still don't have, sadly, but if we did, we'd be in a much better position. But uh, Angelo was an early backer. But anyway, uh, among his, um, he inspired a lot of enmity in bureaucrats. And about mm, ten or twelve years ago, at the Lincoln Fellowship, one of our one of our fellows who'd been in the Bush administration uh, on the defense side and had gotten run out of the Bush administration for insisting we take seriously. Islamic ideology as a guide to some terrorist uh, actions and strategy. You know, this was Islam was a religion of peace after all in the George W. Bush administration. So they they ran a lot of these people out after the first few years. And um, he said, "Oh, Angelo, uh, it's wonderful to meet you in person. I uh, I live in Manassas with a bunch of former agency people uh, and current agency people, and they told me to give you the following message." And then the the Lincoln fellow held up, you know the double-handed uh, one single finger salute which you can all imagine what it was and angelo just uproariously you know laughed with great mirth he loved he loved that somewhere he was still pissing off uh and uh and inspiring hatred in intelligence community apparatchiks this brought him great joy uh it's a nice window onto the soul of angelo who was thematic but one other story that i just picked up uh and shared with some folks, um, I think Matt and James saw it at least, but uh, one of Angela's old friends from graduate school, who I'll leave nameless to protect the innocent, said that in the early days, you know, they were, they were at Claremont Graduate School in the 60s uh, when the Weather Underground was active and uh, the local Weather Underground organizer at, at the grad school uh, at one point uh, said, you know, was demanding due process and and Angelo's response, sort of leaning halfway over the table. Uh, and Angelo's not a small man. I'm sure he was even a little taller, probably more like 6'4 back then and, and in his late 20s. Uh, the report was he leaned halfway over the table and said, oh, we'll give you all the process that's due you. Uh, and the, uh, mm -hmm. there was also threats to burn down the library in the heady days of the late 60s. Uh, Harry Jaffa has written about um, 
the fact that, uh, you know, there's even a bomb, two bombs went off on the Claremont College campuses uh, back in 68, I think. And uh, one of them didn't kill anybody, but one of them maimed a, a, the wife of a graduate student. She lost sight in one eye and, and had her fingers on one hand mangled. This, of course, uh, in, incited great and righteous indignation in all in Jaffa and all his grad students. And there was a threat to burn down the library. So Angelo and his friends, grad school friends, set basically a 24 hour vigil to guard the library. Um, our friend Mike Anton's response to this was contrast that, that is Angelo's conduct and his friend's conduct, sort of manly spirited conduct with what, uh, what, what has been reported of, you know, Bloom's graduate students at Cornell when the, when the, Black Panthers basically took over the place and, or, or, uh, and the black student activists uh, took people hostage and basically demanded a revision of the curriculum and got their way with rifles, among other things. Uh, the best that some of Bloom students could do was write, write some notes with some quote from the Republic on them, uh, Plato, you know, that, that'll get them. So uh, it's, it's a nice contrast. I don't mean to indict Bloom or anything, but just an interesting, uh, interesting contrast. And now, now that I think about it, uh, speaks volumes about some differences between West Coast and East Coast Straussians. Uh, we don't need to make too much of that, but it's a it's a fun little story. It's one I hadn't heard before. So uh, the one uh, silver lining of this very sad week is that you get uh, a lot of a lot of folks who know that I knew Angelo and then saw the short thing I wrote for the American Mind end up you know sending you stuff that you'd never heard before about you know the last fifty years of Angelo being Angelo, and it's pretty good. I wanted to read uh, one more thing. So the, the thing I read is about education. Seth had that nice quote from one of our American Mind pieces. Uh, James had the covered the ruling, famous ruling class waterfront. This was from, uh, I read from the last thing I think Angelo wrote that he sent to Michael Walsh. Uh, our friend Julie Ponzi published a companion piece in many ways to our piece that we had Angelo do on, on Afghanistan. Uh, this one was just called Epitaph, uh, originally Julie titled it Epitaph for the War on Terror. And uh, this captures, here's a little more blistering rhetoric for you, Seth. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people read this, but it's, it's worth repeating. This is sort of the middle end of the thing. The subhead is, why should a little war interrupt their good time? Uh, the ruling class's first and enduring reaction to 9-11 was to safeguard its relationships with the third world operatives in whom it had invested so many hopes and in whose support and management its members were spending billions of dollars and reaping millions. That is why when the American people demanded the heads of everybody and anybody who had a hand in terrorism, it was essential for CIA Director George Tenet officially to identify the terrorist problem with one man, one organization, and with non-political religious zeal. The point was, don't even think of fighting against anyone else. And within the ruling class, all rejected even considering why have we Americans been targeted more and more by all manner of terrorists? What must we do to put a stop to that? Whoever suggests that we hold foreign governments responsible for inciting violence against Americans wants war with the world. Can't have that. That is why in the aftermath of a defeat that indicts the whole class's conception and execution of policy for two decades, the lead editorials of the leading establishment publications, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal pleaded, we don't, re we don't recall good alternatives being offered over the last 20 years. Correct. Group thinks to guard less reality intrude. Calling what happened next strategy does violence to the English language and to whomever cares to peruse the newspapers circa 2001 to 2003, almost all of which reported who in the government's various parts and among their supporters wanted to do or not do, plus what labels they might use, what information should be withheld to manage public opinion. But you will search in vain for any discussion of why so many people in so many places were finding it attractive to kill Americans and how we might make it unattractive. Instead, the US government and the ruling class wanted to get closer to foreign countries to improve them. This is that, that theme that uh, Seth brought up, to improve them and their attitudes. And it wanted to impose restrictions on Americans because that is what it always wanted and did whenever it could. Avenging 9-11 and preventing its re recurrence served as justification for putting enormous effort and money into unrelated or even counterproductive activities the ruling class sold to Americans as anti-terrorism. The force behind these absurd on their face focus group sales pitches came from the unanimity and lack of discussion with, with which the ruling class media pushed them. 20 years later, 
The same media repeated the same tropes as if events had confirmed them. The Wall Street Journal editorialized that the occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan had largely succeeded in keeping the terrorists on defense, so they found it harder to attack us at home. A few days earlier, Condoleezza Rice, as responsible for these occupations as anyone, had written that we took the fight to the terrorists so that they could never again bring it home to us. On what planet? Afghanistan and Iraq were awash in ethnic militias intent on oppressing or killing one another. Few of the combatants had ever heard of the United States, but our ruling class wants us to believe that hatred for America had so crazed them that instead of slipping across our porous borders and feasting on undefended civilians, they threw themselves at the U.S. armed forces in their country. They really think we're stupid. Uh, he then goes on to show, you know, that, well, bringing a bit of uh, Leninist analysis, that is, who benefits Kui Bono, uh, he says, you know, what really is going on here, or to a large extent, is just imagine how much money went out the door over these 20 years, and all of the generals and contractors and defense folks, uh, you know, how many vacations and yachts and, and uh, re comfy retirements were purchased with all this, what amounted to, in many ways, a giant slush fund to enrich them uh, indefinitely. Anyway, just a, a bit of Angela's analysis. Uh, I, I encourage everyone, I, I hear Spencer, many of you want to say something, but I encourage everyone to, um, to go to the Claremont Review Book Archives review books archives and read his victory watch which started i think the first one was in november of 2001 uh they're uh they're very much worth reading and still quite fresh i mean his made angela one of angela's main points about terrorism or the war on terror was was always um you know it it lacked strategic focus because it really didn't have an any enemy in mind terror of course being an abstraction and it never paid very good attention to the, the, the only thing that really makes terrorism possible, truly, which is re, real regimes. So, uh, uh, you know, Angela always poured scorn on the notion that Al Qaeda, this uh, sort of floating entity, was somehow the sole focus of our, of our strategy or Osama bin Laden at the center of Al Qaeda. He, he never thought Afghanistan made all that much sense, especially in terms of some sort of long-term occupation. There's no real regime in Afghanistan. It was a bunch of warring tribes. Uh, the Taliban uh, mostly didn't really care about America. Uh, they happened to protect a Saudi national who made it in their interest to protect him. That is Osama bin Laden. But uh, we we never really got serious about war, the war on terror. And so we're, we're stuck still today. One of Angela's great lines was the whole point of war is to change the way of life of your enemies, not to change your way of life. So, you know, we still have the Department of Homeland Security, the largest bureaucracy ever created. We still have to suffer the indignities of the TSA with the farce that somehow they're keeping us safe in the sky when, whenever they audit the TSA, you know, something like, uh, you know, one in five weapons that is like pistols will get through TSA security. So uh, Angelo had proper contempt for, for all of this. The other great example he liked to use is, you know, this is how the left and the ruling regime works. When leftists started hijacking airplanes to take them to Cuba, uh, rather than force force Cuba to stop this practice, to force the extortion that was going on, uh, what did the U.S. government do uh, in the 70s? It made it a federal crime to resist hijackers on an airplane. And so he'd like to remind people that what, uh, what Beamer and his friends did on Flight 93 was technically a violation of federal law. Uh, and, uh, and yet they, that now they're regarded as heroes without really any pause by the ruling class to sort of think through uh, how they respond to this sort of thing. They, they're sort of, they continue to run headlong into uh, various forms of statism and various forms of contempt for their own citizenry. There's an element of Angelo's legacy and character that has really been sort of stuck on my mind these last couple of days. And Ryan, a lot of the stories you just told really highlight it. So I just wanted to mention it. And that's the virtue of joyous contempt for people who deserved it. Angelo, I don't, I don't think that I really know anybody who more kind of championed and exemplified that bravado that when somebody was beneath your scorn, you should treat them as such and not, you know, decorously pretend as if the sanctimonious, uh, sort of ruling class 
uh, pieties or or people who present themselves with this kind of borrowed prestige of the great institutions that they've hollowed out that those people aren't aren't worth even really your the effort it, it takes to mock them except in so far as your job is to expose their innumerable failures i mean so much of our own i think you know of, of the rights critique it's fair to say of of democrats and the and the left when they're in in power even when it's quite strong and excoriating it so often seems to me to come from a place of fear and and i think that even when we're calling out the ruling class we can uh do so in a way that sort of betrays our our awe of them of and indeed there are many things that make them awful they have a lot of power um, they're very skillful and maniacal, um, and and they're sort of philosophically dedicated to psychically unmaking the American people. But Angelo, I, I think perhaps in part because of his faith and the depth with which he grasped it, sort of regarded the kings and princes of the world with that scornful disdain that you get in Psalm 2, right? He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh them to scorn, and the Almighty holdeth them in contempt. Um, you have to go back to like St. Thomas More in the Tower of London, uh, advising us all to laugh at the devil in order to find that kind of, you know, blessed, uh, blessed scorn and contempt for the ways of the world and its corrupt princes it really was a remarkable thing. And I think it's inspired actually a lot of the most successful online discourse, which at the American mind, we have really followed as taking the conservative movement into its next level. And, and, and as in some ways, the best hope of a real rebel movement is this kind of antic memory with which people uh, puncture and mock the ruling class. Um, it's ultimately, I think, something that can f only flow out of a faith in your eternal home. Um, and it's something that we really had to look to Angelo to learn because it doesn't come naturally to everybody. Yeah, he I remember I, this way I used to call him the original edgelord. I mean, he yeah. really like you don't get more edgy or based or whatever the hell you want to call it than Angelo Cotavilla. He was there before you. And what he said was edgy, not because he was uh, trying to purposely, uh, you know, uh, move people emotionally or manipulate them. It's because, yeah, you sensed all of a sudden this radical contempt for uh, figures that you're just not supposed to think that way about. And yeah. you remember him from recent seminars talking about Joe Biden in the Senate and just kind of cracking himself up. The, ironic, <laughs> the ironical man, you know, makes the joke to amuse himself. Uh, and he just started laughing about what an idiot Joe Biden is and uh, what an unserious person he is. And, you know, the way he was doing it was just genuine. And, uh, and that's what made him the original, the original edgelord. He had the insights and can, and can frame it in a way that you could just tell it came from completely outside the usual boxes. And in his case, it wasn't a performance. Um, and, and to, uh, to really put a bow on it, I mean, the, the CIA story, you know, again, I still think if you Google Angelo Cotovilla's CIA, you'll see internal memos, the CIA complaining about who the hell the staffer is who's attacking them. Um, his, his continuation of that story, um, which I heard him tell a few times, was that he was at one point then brought in for a meeting with someone high up in the agency at uh, his house. And there were, you know, statues of lions and hounds, as he said, in the yard. And it was this beautiful, uh, beautiful place that he described. He was brought and he said the implication was, you know, all this uh, can be yours. Um, and if you go along and, uh, you know, the basic moral of the story was they, they, uh, the Borg tempts you to be part of it. But what's funny is when I, when I think back about the way he told that story, there wasn't even a, he didn't even have to say, and of course, I didn't go there, right? <laughs> you know, it wasn't really about the temptation of Angelo because the way he told the story, Angelo was never tempted. <laughs> he, <laughs> he despised those people uh, and he, he, he despised uh, them so utterly that it wasn't even a temptation. And some of the, also his experience in, in Boston, I think, um, being around, um, you know, the, the, the ruling class and the intellectual side of things, uh, the way that, that he would talk about it, it was beneath him. And because he really did see the world that way, 
And uh, that, yeah, that's, that's an inspiration from us all. And I, I would say, I mean, very much came from um, his Christianity, his understanding of morality as something being real um, and uh, the human soul being eternal and there being such a thing as justice. Uh, but also it was extended by his education, which was, uh, and, uh, you know, came from uh, a life experience of coming here as an immigrant and, and loving America uh, to, with, and doing everything he could uh, as a patriot throughout his life and, and seeking out what he saw as true. And that he was just formed in a way that is, uh, that is, that is rare, as I said earlier, but also in a way that was outside of the usual technocratic box. It gave him a kind of surety uh, of insight, uh, in, surety um, of his own insights into things insofar as he was given to see them. Yeah, for just um, turning people back to the uh, great things from Angelo to read, I list uh, some of his greatest hits, but everyone should go get his books. Um, some sadly are out of print, but if, if you, they're all rewarding in their way, uh, just if we have them up on the ClaremontReviewBooks.com website, if you click on Angelo Cotavilla Rip, which is the first thing that'll come up, at ClaremontReviewBooks.com, you'll see a, a quick little bibliography. And then I encourage you to search, just pull up his author page, art, author page at ClaremontReviewBooks.com and see all the stuff he's written. I just turn people to one thing that's always been a favorite of mine because really only Angelo has the kind of background to paint the whole picture. Um, but he has this piece um, called The Chosen One. Uh, if you If you Google... The Chosen One, The Rise and Rise of Barack Obama and Coda Village, go right to it. Um, but it's about how Obama, contrary to popular myth, was not just sort of a self-created, you know, up by his bootstraps uh, kid of a single mother, uh, but rather sort of knit, knit into, in various interesting ways, um, the post-Cold War intelligence community, larger apparatus, you know, his grandmother. Basically, you know, he went to fancy schools everywhere, including uh, the fancy school in Hawaii, where his grandmother ran a bank uh, that was basically a CIA money laundering front. Uh, I mean, not only that, but it was involved in funding overseas adventurism. Uh, so it's it just a nice contrarian take on Obama and the sources of his um, rise and success. And then the, in many ways, the mature Obama and the ways in the ways he thought about the world and the ways he moved in American politics and still moves in American politics, uh, the piece uh, proves to be very revealing of, of how all that came to be and how Obama came to be uh, one among many, many of those types of pieces. Uh, Angelo was also a great hater of Henry Kissinger, mm. uh, which is fun, fun to go track down. We have a number of negative Kissingerian stuff uh, in the CRB archives. And then I encourage everyone, if they want a nice, smart guy fight, um, go find Angelo Cotavilla's, I think there are like three or four back and forths with Conrad Black in the National Review online archives about this question of Kissinger. Conrad Black, of course, a great admirer of Kissinger's and Angelo, um, a, a, a long time uh, and well-earned critic. Uh, you know, Angelo, I think, has read all of Kissinger's great books and, and uh, finds much to uh, criticize. But at, and really at root, it's one of these deep philosophical criticisms, which is ultimately Henry Kissinger is kind of a, uh, uh, well, a Hegelian of sorts or a historicist. And that, that notion that history has a certain direction uh, would shape profoundly, I think, your approach to war and peace and your, especially your long game approach to it in something like the Cold War. Uh, and I think Angelo, in that sense, the thought Kissinger was intellectually corrupt. Uh, at sort of at a, at a root point, even if if unconsciously or half consciously. So as in everything that Angelo wrote, you know, there was quite a bit behind it. It was not mere um, enmity, though he he did have some enmity for for Kissinger. Mm -hmm. It's another way in which he's kind of heterodox. You know, Kissinger's kind of a hero of uh, many on the kind of realist foreign policy right, um, and many parts in between, but. Uh, I think Angelo had his number. A man we should remind everyone, and Angelo did this too, would do this too. 
uh, you know, Kissinger is sort of instrumental in many ways of opening the West up to China and profiting handsome, handsomely uh, off of it. And uh, we, we should say, I guess, one cheer for Kissinger is that he, he did, well, he did it for, I think, uh, reasons of staying in the game, but also uh, presumably because he thought he might benefit his country. But he was not a kind of inveterate, never Trumper, and did try to advise the White House uh, to what he thought I'm sure it was the benefit of the country. So there's a bit of public spirit in Kissinger while there's also a lot of um, peace made a, a decent fortune off of it too. Uh, I just want to add one more little bit here. David Goldman, who's a Washington fellow at the, mm -hmm. our center for the study, or so, sorry, for the center for the American way of life, um, reading and talking at the same time, never a good idea. <laughs> uh, just published a, uh, a remembrance of, uh, of Angelo at the Asia times, uh, under his, uh, his pseudonym Spengler, which is now public knowledge. It's an exchange of letters, largely last letters exchange between himself and, uh, and Angelo. And so, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking out of school when I just quote from, uh, from one of these, uh, from, uh, from, uh, Goldman to Cotevilla. Uh, just this this first paragraph here. He says, thanks for writing and for your kind words. I advanced this thesis, which we can talk about later if we want, with trepidation and am enormously reassured that you found it worthwhile. As I've told any number of friends, I want to be Angelo Cotevilla when I grow up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he, yeah, Goldman always, he says that all the time. He's like, I want to be Angelo. You know, so I've always said, I want to be Angelo Cotevilla when I grow up. And uh, I know exactly what he means. <laughs> I would say too, I mean, just some more. I mean, he, I, again, we can't emphasize enough what a kind, you know, mentor and uh, uh, helpful kind of person he was to anyone and everyone who sought advice, assistance, and anything else. And just, you know, a very gracious, um, very gracious man. Um, at the same time, I would say of all the old men I've ever known, I would be most scared of him being able to shiv me in a fight. <laughs> um, he's, he's the only the only one who ever i thought well you know i you don't know angelo you know he he come at you uh and and uh you know that's the kind of fiery fiery uh fiery soul he had uh, but also there's another quality too i think with with uh great figures like this is that he ended up involved in so many interesting things right i mean it, even you know just lately you call him up and he'd be doing something unbelievably interesting um and important based on relationships that had kind of been cultivated over time and a penchant for going right to the heart of uh right to the heart of things and that that really is as other people have said comes across in his writing i mean it's remarkable that when people uh, really desired you know desire a, a kind of um someone to lay out a, a roadmap uh, of what should be done uh, and then you you look and you see, you know, okay, so what should be written to address this question, this problem? Uh, Angelos can write something that could be equally useful to, um, you know, the policymaker and the man on the street. And, and that's just, I mean, that's just a remarkable, remarkable talent. And in that respect, I'd say if you look at our, uh, the, the essay he, he did on the CIA and the FBI and how it should all be reformed, it's the kind of piece of writing that will be valuable to those who actually want to, you know, God forbid, do what he tells them there and, and affect real change. Uh, but it's also the kind of essay that you can give to a, a friend of relative intelligence who reads things and they'll be blown away by it. And, and, and that is not just a kind of, uh, you know, sophistical talent of rhetoric. That's because someone actually sees to the heart of things and is able to articulate it. And, 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 and I mean, I, he would do that in, in so many different ways um, on, on so many different topics. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, we, were, yeah. we were lucky to know him. Yeah, well, we can leave it there. I, uh, we're at almost an hour. But we'll have much more to say about Angelo in the coming weeks, as I said in uh, my little little eulogy i encourage folks to just go around and read some of the remembrances uh, julie ponzi has a nice one up in american greatness called angelo privilege uh, she recounts among other things you know he'd give her parenting advice 
He had. Uh, I just correct the record quickly. Matt said five sons. Angelo had four sons and one daughter, and they're all. Uh, I remember. Well, one last story. Uh, I was in Angelo's sort of home office, and there was a picture of. It was one of his boys' weddings, and the Angelo. Uh, Angelo was about six four. Anne Cotavilla, his wife, who survives him, uh, along with all his kids and grandkids. Anne's Anne's about six feet tall herself. So you can imagine uh, the kids are are um, impressive specimens. And uh, I pointed to the picture, said, oh, the wedding. He said, oh, yes, at the wedding. He said, uh, all four boys were there. Uh, it was over, what did he say? He said something like, over, 100, over 550 pounds of Cotavilla walking down the aisle. <laughs> uh, he was very proud of his stra- strapping strapping sons. Um, uh, one of whom, you know, lives lives out in Wyoming, pretty near the near the ranch. I'm, I'm sure Matt was in contact with him when he was get, going out to the ranch. Angelo, as Matt said, you know, he had an eye for beautiful places, and he was lucky and that um, he could go out and buy them when they were cheap. So he bought the ranch in the seventies. I think he bought a 10 acre port piece of square of a, a big rancher's lot. And I, he, re, he told me, I think it was in 72, maybe he told me he paid, uh, at the time, I think he paid, uh, $6,000 an acre for it. And everyone said, Oh, it's outrageous. Um, out completely outrageous. And, uh, and now, that area of Wyoming, um, right there in the valley. I forget exactly where it is. So I don't need to have people descend on beautiful piece of land, but now, you know, it's a bunch of billionaires everywhere around him. So he always had an eye for that sort of thing. Um, anyway, his family scattered across the country. Um, but, uh, his legacy will be kept alive in his kids, his work. We should all revisit it, read it, reread it. Uh, I happy to report too, that I need to, um, We'll, we'll sort it all out depending on what his kids want to do, of course. But uh, the plan was to have a volume come out uh, through Encounter Books, uh, Roger Kimball's excellent um, publishing house, uh, about what would John Quincy Adams do and w- what would that mean for a truly America first foreign policy. I uh, Forgive me one more time for repeating the story. I, I told it uh, on the live stream. But the uh, Office of Net Assessment at the Department of Defense and the Trump administration, a couple of them asked Angelo, you know, what is an America first foreign policy? So Angelo being Angelo, about four or five months later, he sent them 75,000 words, uh, the first two thirds of which was what would John Quincy Adams do? Uh, And the last third of which was, you know, what does that mean for our current strategic positions in the world and our adversaries and how we ought to conduct ourselves? Uh, Etc. So that will see the live day in some form, and uh, we'll we'll look forward to that. It uh, will be one last fitting tribute to a life well lived and uh, a legacy uh, we're all the beneficiaries of. So, Angelo, rest in peace. Thank you all for listening to the roundtable. If you want to learn more about our work, go to Claremont.org, ClaremontReviewBooks.com, AmericanMind.org or our new Washington, D.C. Center site, dc.claremont.org. That's the Center for the American Way of Life. Uh, Please rate, subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your your podcasts. Rate us well. It helps uh, spread the the good message of the American mind. Uh, Keep an eye out for special episodes. We're doing uh, a number of sub-podcasts now, including The Stakes, where Michael Anton talks to guests, or The Interview, where I interview one of our senior scholars about their latest work. And then, of course, our occasional Uh, special editions of the American mind, uh, these longer form audio documentaries on topics of, of importance. So check all that out. And importantly as well, if you'd like to support our work, go to www.claremont.org slash donate. And as always, thank you to the production and engineering crew and Alyssa Lee and Jake Gannon. And thank you to you all. Talk to you next week. 